90.3 WHPC wants to let you know that Wednesday, April 17th, is our second ever WHPC day at Miller's Ale House of Levittown. On Wednesday, April 17th, Miller's Ale House of Levittown is hosting a Give Back Day to support WHPC. More information can be found by searching for 90.3 WHPC on Facebook at 903 WHPC on Twitter or at 903 WHPC on Instagram. Miller's Ale House is located at 30. 3046 Hempstead Turnpike in Levittown, across from the Tri-County Flea Market, where WHPC's Give Back Day is Wednesday, April 17th, from 11.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. Thanks to you and Miller's Ale House of Levittown for supporting the non-commercial educational radio at the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. This show is brought to you by the Paramount in Huntington, who presents Classic Albums Live, The Beatles, Abbey Road 50th Anniversary, on Saturday, April 6th at 8 p.m. More information can be found online at ParamountNY.com. Winner of the Best Public Affairs Program Award from the 2019 Intercollegiate Broadcasting System. Listen to Your Family's Health, Tuesday afternoons at 3. FM, HD, Amazon Echo, Google Home, the TuneIn Radio app, the iHeartRadio app, and nccradio.org. This is 90.3 WHPC. WHPC HD. Garden City. Long Island. New York. Welcome to another edition of From the Press Box right here on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College and the 2019 winner of Community College Station of the Year. Yippee, 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 yeah. Anyway. We um, we rule. We're part of the Sports Talk family, which is uh, from the Press Box, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Mondays. Sports Talk, 5 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday, Thursday at 9 p.m. and Friday at 3 p.m. I am Rob Lennon. Joining me, as always, is my brother and, yes, award-winning sports writer, Tim Leonard. Hello, brother. How are you? Good morning, brother. How are you? We doing? I'm doing well. How are you? That's good. See, this week we can talk about football because it means something. Oh, he shaved. You just noticed? (laughs) I just noticed. Well, I don't look at you when you come in the car. I'm looking straight ahead, being safe on the road. Yes, brother. You know, it's not like saying, oh, look. You know, matter of fact, the beard looked better. But this is old Tim Leonard. You just need the mustache hanging out over For a week. I was going to I was gonna do it to show the people on the Facebook Live, but uh, that won't be happening today. Well, you can run out to car in the middle. In the middle <laughs> yeah, of the show. Okay. You, you, sure. And we parked way in the back today. Commercial, commercial break. And we parked way in the back in the do, parking lot. Do this. Do that. The 200 yard sprint like Michael Johnson. Yeah. So, so anyway, JP Pelsman, uh, writer for Forbes.com, football writer for Forbes.com, will be joining us about 9 25. And we can also talk, brother, with, uh, well, at least for me, uh, with some knowledge about the NCAA basketball tournament, men's basketball tournament. Very good. Bro. Because there is a women's basketball tournament. Of course. Too. So, do they go by March of Madness also? Uh, yes, but I don't. I'm pretty sure they do also use the term Final Four, but the NCAA is very particular. Well, the reason I bring it that. up is, for those who don't know, years ago, Tim was a was the premier college hockey writer in the country. And he did a story once on how the hockey people, the college hockey people, can't call their thing the Final Four, even though it's the NCAAs. And you would think they're all one big happy family. Damn it. Damn it. But, but no, they're not. But they're not. And they can't call themselves the Final Four in hockey. They call themselves the Frozen they had, Four. They had to come up with that. I helped come up with that, um, by the way. I know you did. So it, it's it's kind of interesting that even though it's in-house, they, they're not allowed to use it. Nope. And, of course, now, you know, it, the Final Four is, is a trademark thing. Exactly. And, That's why and they didn't March want hockey Madness using it. is, too. So what's happened is you hear a lot of ads this month. Um, you know, like I heard one before that said, you know, I hope your hoop dreams come true or something like that. And it's like, well, we can't call, you know, March Madness. Well, that's like with, with the Super Bowl. Right. When, when, when the Super Bowl, when all kinds of companies 
when when you know, they want to hook onto it without actually paying the NFL. Yeah, when 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 companies have competitions and all oh, win a Super Bowl ticket or win a TV to watch the Super Bowl, right. they always call it the big game. Right, which is even worse. It's just so, so stupid. Because if they use the term Super Bowl, they have to pay the NFL. I, I would call it the, the, the championship. Whatever. But you know, the football championship is much better than the big game. Well, I don't know. You know. Doesn't matter. Anyway, brother, let's 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 talk about what we need to talk about. Okay. First of all, your favorite team of all time, Duke. Again. Surprising, brother. Is no. the number one seed in the tournament? Not surprising. Why? Why not? You hate Duke. No, I mean, I, 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 I very much dislike Duke, but it, it would be hard to I argue. Think, I think you call them criminals many times. Well, the many times they are. But it would, it would be hard to argue that, uh, that, that Duke isn't deserving of the number one seed. So I didn't, I didn't have a problem with it. Uh, surprisingly to me, that, that they're not, not playing in North Carolina. They're playing in South Carolina. Oh. Which you know, isn't, exa- isn't exactly a, a, a big detriment for them. I'm sure that uh, there's plenty of Duke fans in, in South Carolina as well, and it's obviously a very short trip. But, uh, you know, it's, it, usually Duke is a number one seed and is playing about 20 miles down the road. Uh, but... You know, it is what it is. It's uh, they're, they're playing South Car- in South Carolina. They're they're playing uh, two teams that that I've pretty much never heard of uh, for a play-in game. They're playing the winner of uh, North Carolina Central and North Dakota State. Wow. Uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, you know that that's that's that'll be uh, that'll be a forty-point win, easy if if not more. You know, Zion Williamson will play uh, will play maybe twenty minutes in that game. Uh, it'll be a nice uh, nice tune-up. Uh, for them uh, to to play the winner of uh, Virginia Commonwealth in Central Florida. So so each d- division now has uh, two play in games. Is that the deal? <clears throat> uh, well, no. Each bracket has one. Well, actually, well, actually, you know, let me, I'm just looking real quick. Uh, the answer is no, no, okay. because the East and the West both have two play in games. Oh, okay. Uh, the East, besides North, uh, North Carolina Central and North Dakota State, also has Belmont versus Temple. And the winner of that will be the 11 seed, and will face Maryland. Uh, Belmont is is a very strong upset candidate. Uh, there, that's that's a good team, and that's a team that belonged in the tournament. And nobody was sure if they were going to get an at large bid, and then they did. So the tournament committee actually got one right for a change. Uh, the other in the West uh, the, for the 16 seed, we have Fairleigh Dickinson University yeah, yeah. back in my old stomping grounds in Bergen County, uh, New Jersey, uh, is playing Prairie View A and M. Uh, for the right to be the 16 seed and face Gonzaga, yeah, uh, and they'll get a, they'll get a thumping out in out in Salt Lake City. Uh, those play-in games, by the way, are being played in Dayton, Ohio, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, the FDU game is is I I thought it was Wednesday, but now it's, I'm looking at the schedule and it says Gonzaga is playing on Thursday, so I doubt they're playing Wednesday. That probably is a Tuesday game. <clears throat> and uh, the other play-in game, which is li- it has a little bit of fun to it, uh, a couple of gym rats. Going against each other on uh, the sidelines with Chris Mullen and St. John's playing against Bobby Hurley and Arizona State. That's going to be a fun That'll one. That'll be a fun one. It's a couple of East Coast guys, a couple of East Coast legends, really. Let's face it. And Bobby Hurley was a legend as well. Uh, but uh, going at it with, with their teams, and we'll, we'll see. Uh, you know, Arizona State kind of kind of had a, a, a stumble in, in – uh, in, in the uh, Pac-12 tournament, uh, that was the game. <laughs> Bill Walton, I'm going to go on a tangent here, brother, like you usually do, but I'm going to do it this time. Uh, Bill Walton was calling that Arizona State game the other night, and as far as – there's, there's two, two schools of thought on Bill Walton. People either love him or they hate him, and, and I love the guy because he, he, to me he is, he is the basketball equivalent of Phil Rizzuto. You never know what he's going to say. <laughs> uh, but the game, the Arizona State game, went to overtime the other night. And Bill Walton desperately, apparently, needed to go to the bathroom. Wow. So he leaves. And what I guess Bill Walton didn't realize was in between regulation and overtime, it, it's a minute, maybe two. Right. So Bill Walton's off at the bathroom, and the guy who's doing the, the color, I think his name is Dave Pash, says, uh, well, we're about to start overtime here, and uh, Bill Walton's not back. Apparently had to go use the restroom. Uh, but uh, you know he he should be uh, should be back shortly, and then he pauses for a second. He says, "Yeah, I know some of you probably don't probably are hoping that Bill Walton doesn't come back." <laughs> and uh, I'm like, "Wow, this is the guy you work with." So wow. they tap the ball, play is starting to go on, and in the bottom of the screen, 
You could see Bill Walton walking up the sideline. Really? <laughs> He's up to miss. He's six foot eleven. So here comes Bill Walton walking up the sideline, and you hear pass it. Oh, and here comes Bill Walton, and I forget who it was, but all of a sudden it was a big dunk, and I don't know. Bill Walton must have ran because he was nowhere near where he needed to be. But the dunk happens. Pash calls the dunk, and out of nowhere you hear, "Throw it down, big man." <laughs> It was phenomenal. <laughs> you gotta love it. You gotta love it. But yeah, that was to me that was the moment of of the conference tournaments for me. But uh, but yeah, Bobby Hurley, uh, who was uh, you know still still young in his career uh, with college basketball, yeah. which is why he's still at Arizona State right now. Obviously, he's not a basketball power, but he's turned it into a, a decent uh, a decent school so far, and hopefully that will lead to him getting a better job and coming back east. Well, I, uh, I think also you know you look at St. John's, uh, what's the third year or fourth year for. I believe it's the third year for Chris Yeah, okay. Mullen. So he makes a, he, finally, he makes a tournament after three years. Not bad. Not bad. Well, considering you know? what he started with, yeah, right, it's, yeah. it's great. So, <laughs> so, I mean, this is— Chris to, Mullen started with garbage. To me, I, I was thinking that, you know, let's say he—I th- I was thinking St. John's was NIT this year, which I— you know, No, I mean, they were a bubble team. They've been a, they've been a bubble team for, for a few weeks now. They've been right. mentioned in that, in I, that last four I, in I know they had, they had a couple of good weeks in a row. My thing about him is, is that I'm thinking that he's gotten to the point where— you know, do I really need this? Well, it's you know? his alma mater. That's right, why I, I know if that. It was, but if you it know was any other school, I don't think Chris Mullen would be coaching right now. I, I think right. he'd just be enjoying the fact that that he made how many tens of millions of dollars playing basketball, and and he, you know he'd be he'd be living in Manhattan and just enjoying life. But this, I, you know, I mean, I don't want to say this gives him a purpose because I think coaching. It does. Well, coaching at college basketball is a really it's it's. Ultra time consuming. Of course, you don't, you don't have free time. You have to be uh, seducing all these players you want for your team. That's a weird word, but okay, but that's what it is. But negotiating. He, How's he, that? He, well, let's say attracting. I mean, it's it's he's Chris Mullen. He, he's he's a legendary player. I the thing is, I don't know how many current players know him because I mean, no, they the, don't know the, who the is. young the younger crowd is there. I hate to say their it, but parents, the young, their parents their parents know, parents know him, but the younger crowd these days their attention no. spans are about 10 minutes. And they don't so, show a lot of these old games. You know, if well, it'd, be yeah. not, it'd be nice, you know, occasionally you see some old uh, Georgetown St. John's game from 85. Right. When, you, know, you see was, some of the brawls. Yeah, you, you you see, you know, the big defensive matchups that these games right. were. Well, the, it was muggings too. Right? Well, <laughs> You know, defensive matchups. It was guys. Defense brawling. has changed in, in, in yeah, thirty five years. Uh, the referees don't, don't let him play defense like that anymore. But but you know, Chris Mullen has that advantage. He can walk into a recruit's house and say, "Hi, I'm Chris Mullen. I was on the dream team." Right, right. You know, and Patrick Ewing can say the same thing. He can. You know, but these and are, both these of are, them, interestingly enough, have ne- never won an NBA championship. They were on the dream team, but they did not win an well, NBA. Championship. You know, Michael Jordan was around. What are you I know. Do? I know. I'm just saying. But uh, you know, it's you know getting back getting back to the tournament. Let's talk about the tournament. Um, you know, it's good for St. John's. Obviously, he Chris Mullen is is building something there. He, he's you know obviously trying to get St. John's back on the map. Uh, and and this is this is a good thing. And the fact that they're in is it's obviously a positive. Uh, everybody expects Shamari Pons, their their top player, top scorer, to to turn pro after this season. So that's gonna that's gonna hurt. But. It, this making the NCAA tournament only helps St. John's because Mullen needs needs achievements and accomplishments like this to point to recruits and say, "Look, the Big East isn't it isn't Villanova and everybody else. Right? You know, we're a relevant team, and it's still a relevant conference. And this is why you need to come play here. Uh, and he needs to be able to keep New York kids. And you know, the the problem." I think that that we've had in recent years, there aren't as many really top talents coming out of New York like there used to be. Oh yeah, but it's too bad because New York, well, it, I, you know, in I'm many not, ways is the center of basketball. In, in many ways, true. It, when the Knicks are winning or, or the Nets now winning, uh, th- this town will only talk about basketball for a while. True, but so. but you're, you're getting a lot more good recruits from from like the Baltimore area, right. Chicago, even even Detroit. I'm not saying there aren't good players in New York, because obviously there are a lot of good players in New York. But Mullen needs to be able to keep the top players here. And and the sad part is the top players here tend to go to the ACC. You know, they'll go to Duke or North Carolina. Well, that's or a good place to just, go. They're just getting out of New York. Right. They, but he needs, he needs to keep the top New York players in New York. Right, I agree. And it, it's, it's a tough sell, because part of that is because of the Big East. I agree. You know, the Big East isn't what it used to be. That's That, that much is a fact. But... You know that's his job. 
And and that's that's what being Chris Mullen should help him do. Yeah. Because now you you you're looking at you're looking does a kid want to play for a legend or does he want to go down to to North Carolina or Duke or whatever? You know, let's face it, Duke these days it, that's where one and dones go. Yeah. And and uh, good for them, but that's that's not a, know, that's it, not that's not a model to win championships. But think about think about, you know, you're going down to Duke and you one and done and then you get your 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 contract even though it's a rookie contract with the NBA. Right. You know, you're but, still getting a lot of money. Of course. You know, think think about if you knew two years now you're going to make three million dollars. You know, that might be a pretty good deal. Well, what I'm saying, I, I'm not necessarily endorsing that Mullen gets one and dones. Although obviously the talent level would help St. John's in the short term, but he needs to try to build a program, and it's tough to try, it's tough to build a program with one and dones because unless you get a couple of them at the same time, and then that will start attracting others. You know, like that's why that's why Duke and Kentucky get those kids now because that's where they go. They say, "All right, you know what? One and done. I know I'm going to start next year as a freshman because the guys who are the freshmen now are going to all go into the NBA. Right. You know, Zion Williams and R.J. Barrett, all those guys, they're all going pro a- after the season, and they're going to have three or four number one picks. And, and the same Kentucky's probably going to have at least three number one picks as well. So players know that they're not going to have guys in their way because all of those guys are leaving now." I would I again I don't endorse that for St. John's because I'd like to see him build something, but if that was the if that became the model, I'm, I'm sure Mullen wouldn't mind because he'd have some obviously some really top talented players in his program and that would elevate the program. That's another sure. way to do it, but well, it's I'm, not the recommended. Way I, I'm, I'm happy that you know at, uh, St. John's is back in the in the NCAA. I think that's very important for New York at basketball. I think it's important for St. John's. Um, you know who didn't make it though, brother. Who's that? Uh, your alma mater, Hofstra. Our director's alma you know mater. <clears throat> you know Sean. what? It, Hofstra. They two three weeks ago. You would have thought they were going to nah, four or five weeks ago. Okay, you, th- you would have thought they were going to get a, a berth in the NCAA. Oh yeah, of course they won eighteen games in a row. They were the hottest uh, team in the country. Yeah, when what happened? But they they've stumbled. They they for, they, they forgot. Stumbled, they tripped and hurt they, they, hit their head. They forgot how to play defense the way the way they needed to play defense, and and they didn't share the ball as well. I mean, they they beat Delaware in the conference tournament in the semifinals. Delaware, the team they beat by forty, and I think it was twenty something during the season, and and they had to go to overtime to beat them in the semifinals, and that was just one of many games where they just they didn't play well. And and something something was missing after that that winning streak. And, and Joe Mahalik, the coach over at Hofstra, said during the winning streak, he, he was quoted as saying, "You know, I've told the guys we we can't peak now. We need to peak in March. And 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 if this is our peak, then we're not doing it right. Well, that's what happened. They're not doing it right. And Hofstra winds up with a number seven seed in the NIT, which means the conference isn't getting getting any kind of respect no, at no, all. No. And you know, to me." And and I was talking about this with a friend of the show, John Valenti, uh, yesterday, and, and actually for, for probably for the last couple week or two. Hofstra needs to think about getting out of that conference because that they're going nowhere. And and the, the 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 fact that Northeast Northeastern got a 13 seed, which isn't bad, but right. they're playing Kansas, and, and Kansas isn't Kansas this year, but but they're a four seed, and they and they should destroy Northeastern. But Hofstra getting a seven seed after winning the regular season title in the league, right. seven seed in the NIT, that just shows you what, what lack the of lack respect. of respect, wow. that, that there's nothing there as, as far as you know, what people think. So they they need they really need to look at trying to get them into maybe the, the A10 or, or I wouldn't even say the MAC because the MAC is a terrible league too, but they need to get into a more relevant conference and, and you know, it, Years ago, they they stuck around because of football, and then and then a couple of years later, they ended football. So so the, their their plan was kind of re- reminiscent of what the Giants are doing now, which basically is just to say there was no plan. But they really, if they if 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 basketball is going to be their main sport, and obviously it is, they need to be in a more relevant conference because seven seed in the NIT. It's well, it's the only thing ridiculous. they have at Hofstra. They you know they got rid of football years ago, right? Um, maybe some baseball. Women's softball, maybe or women's soccer? softball is it, women's softball and lacrosse are probably their two best sports over there. Yeah. Um, anyway, also uh, it, it seems that Rich Rich Patino's son is coaching Rich Richard Patino over at uh, Minnesota. You know that I, that is that's, that the NCAA does this at least once or twice in the tournament, 
And I'm convinced that that's why St. John's and Arizona State are playing each other in the playing game. Right. Because you have Bobby Hurley against Chris Mullen. It creates but, stories, brother. But Minnesota, coached by Richard Pitino, the, the, uh, the offspring of, of Rick Pitino, is playing Louisville. The team that fired Rick Pitino what, three years ago, I think it was. So... That's a that's a nice built in storyline. It is, you know, <laughs> and you know, you know, the son is going to want to going to want to curb stomp Louisville after what they did to his dad, but that that's going to be one of the more fun storylines of of the tournament. Is you know, the, it, 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 again, the tournament committee likes to see what they can stir up and what kind of drama they can create. You know, a, a few years back, uh, they they had the Louisville playing Kentucky. And it's probably more than a few years back, but Louisville played Kentucky in in an early round game because the two two teams refused to play each other. Here they are, state rivals, and they would not play each other. Well, you know what? The NCAA tournament took care of it. Right, right. So it's like you guys aren't going to schedule it, and, and you aren't, aren't going to give the fans what they want. We'll take care of it for you. Thank you very much. Well, that's so. You know, but that at least was, they stood up a little bit. You know? That was this. This is a great matchup, Minnesota and Louisville, for otherwise what would be a nondescript game. Right, but. I'm I'm now curious about that game, and I think a lot of basketball fans are curious about that game now, just because of the the son going against the father's former team, and and you know the the school that, and I'm I'm not even going to say that that Louisville did Patino wrong because that program was out of control when he got fired, and and he was deservedly fired as far as I'm concerned. I mean Patino the 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 the, the program was was to the point where it was lawless and. They were there. Your 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 favorite your favorite word, brother. There was hookers all over the place, and they I were love that. hookers for recruits. That's and it was it was. That's what you got to do nowadays. Patino kept saying, "Oh, I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing. It was all my assistant coaches." How can a coach not know anything? Especially that was someone going like on? Rick Patino, who's all over the place. But but you know? even even if he's doing appearances or do what do whatever, I mean, it's impossible for a head coach not to know anything that's going on in this program. So. I, again, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and cry for Rick Patino or say that Rick Patino was a victim. But no, no, but please. but this this does add an element to the game that otherwise wouldn't be there, like I said. So it makes it it makes it a much more fun first round game. Okay, we're gonna take a break right now. We're gonna talk football when we get back. We'll hopefully have JP Pelsman on the phone. Uh by the way, brother, um Chris Mullen, four years. This is his fourth year. Fourth year? year? All right, fourth year. Good. My bad. First year was eight and twenty four, fourteen, nineteen. Next year, sixteen and seventeen. Year three, twenty-one and twelve. This year, see building. That's, That's what he's got. Not, not a bad thing. Building. You're listening to ninety point three WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College Sports Talk on your radio at ninety point three FM. Also, we're on uh, the iHeart Radio app. We're on the TuneIn app, and we're at nccradio.org. Tim, you're at Twitter at at real Tim Leonard. All hit music. For all those songs radio has forgotten about, join me, Big Ed, Mondays from 10 a.m. till noon for the Good Gold Show. We'll bring back all the great hits of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and more. The sounds of doo-wop to disco, all the Motown soul and great rock and roll. We'll even take your requests and dedications to the Good Gold Show. Music. On the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC and streaming on the iHeartRadio app. Shake off the realities of the day, broaden your musical horizons, and embrace the diversity every Monday evening at 6 on Revelations. The show offers a potently unique collection of music with an emphasis on themes and rock rarities. An occasional tour de force of blues and soul mixed with compelling sets of folk and folk rock. I'm Steve Kay, and I've got the perfect soundtrack for your drive home every Monday evening at 6 on Revelations. Right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. If you think all the great music has already been written, think again. Hi, I'm Kim Tracy, and I will prove to you that great new music is still being produced today. Join me on High Fidelity every Sunday at 9 a.m. for a mix of music with a focus on new music and lesser-known artists exclusively on the voice of Nassau Community College worldwide on the iHeartRadio app, the TuneIn Radio app, nccradio.org, and always on 90.3 WHPC. How long does it take to get to the forest? That's not far. What are we going to do? Hike? Sure. 
Are we there yet? Yep. It's a short drive from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Ninety point three WHPC from the press box on your radio or your listening device. By the way, this becomes a, a I was going to say a podcast, and it is a podcast afterwards on Spreaker dot com and iHeartRadio. Uh, it's always there. We have it up within you know a couple hours after we're up on the show. Say like podcast. It podcast. Is a podcast. I, I like podcasts. Yeah. Anyway, we're gonna. Uh, See if we can get J.P. Pelsman on the phone. J.P., are you there? Hey, Rob, right here. All right, Good J.P. Morning, you and Tim. J.P. Pelsman, uh, morning, JP. Uh, football writer, or is it Jets writer? Is it specifically Jets or football writer? Specifically for Jets, yes. For Forbes.com. And uh, it's been a busy week in uh, NFL football. It's been a busy week for the Jets. And, uh, you know, the excitement last week, uh, J.P., of the Combines, you know, Timmy almost couldn't talk on the air because the excitement of watching people do uh, 40... Forty yard dashes. Uh, Forty yard dashes. You know, he was all excited. I, you know, so I don't, I don't know how you felt, but well, I, I understand your frustration, Rob. But the thing is, <laughs> give the NFL uh, uh, credit, as uh, uh, a certain uh, broadcaster might say. Uh, they made this into some kind of a thing where people actually uh, are interested in it. And like you said, though, it's a bunch of guys running around cones and doing all this kind of stuff that really is boring. I mean, I get the draft because it's like a... I love the draft. Christmas morning or, or your birthday, or for some people, those are the same the same day. But, That's uh, Tim Leonard. Thank but, you very much. Uh, exactly. Well, I knew that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, you know, I'll tell you guys, you know, seriously, this is the truth. When Herm Edwards was coaching the Jets, he once had a great line about how... Now, I'm sure the Jets did it during the time he was there. I mean, I remember that a nose tackle named Dwayne Robertson that uh, Terry Bradway drafted that was kind of a workout warrior. But Herm once said, uh, he said uh, in his inimitable way, I don't want a guy who can run around a cone. I want a guy who can run around another guy. <laughs> Which sums it up, you know what I mean? You got to love Herm. Line. You know, if you could beat guys off the edge or you could, you know, hold if you're an offensive lineman and go hold your block, that's more important to me than, wow, look at what he did in that uh, – you know, whatever. But but again, they've made it a cottage industry, so give the NFL credit. They, they now, certainly know how to market themselves. Now, JP, why don't they just start a new version of Superstars? You know, go back to the 70s, bring Kyle Rowe Jr. back, or uh, Dick Button or whatever, you know, and let's do Superstars instead. You know, know, I see the, can the any of these guys swim? That's the question. So I wish we were on Facebook Live so that people could see me just shaking my head. Oh, uh, you know, well, it, it, all I can say is, you know, to me, the combine and the Superstars is the same, except I enjoyed the Superstars. Yeah, and well, yeah, and you don't get to see Johnny Bench like I think he's still riding that bike. I think. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that and, and none of those guys could ever. None of them could ever swim. You know, it was no, like, they couldn't swim and they couldn't ride. A, a lot of them couldn't ride a bike. Yeah, that maybe. was funny. It was funny stuff. So uh, it was a busy week for you last week, huh, JP? Yeah, pretty busy because I'm also I also do some college hoops. So yeah, it was. Ah, a, we were just talking college week, hoops. Yeah. We we're just talking college hoops. We're very um, happy. I do see. I cover Seton Hall for Rivals. dot com as well, and the Jets for Forbes. dot com. Oh, okay, that's great. So. We were talking about Seton Hall. We think they might, you know, make maybe make the second round. I think. Well, it's an interesting matchup because uh, Wofford. I was wrong. I thought it was Wofford, but it's Wofford, like Waffle House, and uh, which there are a lot of obviously in that neck of the woods. That's but uh, it's interesting. They have a terrific three point shooter. I mean, Seton Hall thinks their guy is great, and he is Miles Powell. But they have this uh, three point shooter named Fletcher McGee who shoots forty two point eight percent from the arc, beyond the arc. So. Uh, you know, we'll see. I mean, they have a lot of shooters, so it should be an interesting game. But uh, it's one of those things, don't sleep on I mean, hey, Wofford's the favorite. I mean, they, they've won 20 straight games, so that's a, a tough game. But I know one thing, Seton Hall won't be looking ahead to Kentucky because they already beat them. So it's like, oh, my God, we're scared of Kentucky, you know. So uh, <laughs> we'll see, you know. But it, it's, it is an interesting matchup. Yeah, absolutely. So let's uh, start off with football, brother. What's your first question? Well, I, Jay, I just want to talk, you know, specifically how you think the Jets did. I mean, they had all of this cap money to spend. Uh, obviously, Le'Veon Bell comes with baggage, but to me, he was a guy they absolutely had to sign. Um, but talk about Bell. I mean, I thought I thought they they overpaid massively for for C.J. Mosley, but obviously, he's an outstanding addition. So, just kind of review and and uh, maybe uh, assess how how you think the Jets did. Well, I mean, we can go over guy by guy if you like. Sure, but uh, to, 
to uh, to, to start with the two guys you mentioned. Uh, I think I think the fact that they kind of got Bell at a decent rate makes up for the fact that yes, they did uh, overpay C.J. Mosley. And I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, he will be the second player named C.J. Mosley to play for the Jets. That's exciting. I did they not know that. Def- they had a defensive lineman in the mid two thousands. Uh, whom they acquired in a trade for the immortal Brooks Bollinger. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, there you so go. in other There's, words, the first C.J. Mosley wasn't much. <laughs> no, he wasn't very good. He was he was a he was a rotation player, as they say. But yeah, yeah this guy now this guy should be good. He, I mean, again, like you said, they overpaid. But the, to me, the biggest uh, upshoot of this is, uh, I mean, Darren Lee has to be a goner at some point because. Where is he going to play? I right. mean, he, he he can't play on the outside. He could have played on the outside in a 4-3. I'm still guys kind of puzzled as to why Greg they're making Greg Williams, who's been a 4-3 guy his entire career, run a 3-4. But, I mean, maybe they feel like uh, – I know uh, uh, McCagnan likes the, the, the young defensive tackle, Nathan Shepard, that he drafted in the third round last year. And, I mean, Leonard Williams, I think he got a bad rap last year. I think he, he – he, Occupied a lot of guys. I think he had a better year than people think, but I think they should have gone to the four three. But hey, what do I know? I'm not the, uh, I'm not Greg Williams or Mike McCagnan. <laughs> I don't drink a lot of coffee. So I was going to say coffee. Actually. I was going to say probably probably fortunate for that with the coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't drink any coffee. So, <laughs> but uh, but but Le'Veon Bell just to get to him, I think they they it was a decent price. And the thing I've been stressing in my writing is that what I like about Le'Veon Bell is. A running back takes pressure off the quarterback as opposed to, let's talk about Le'Veon Bell's former team and Antonio Brown. He's one of those guys who would be in Sam Darnold's ear every other second. Hey, throw me the ball, throw me the ball, throw me the ball. Right. I mean, they will call plays for Le'Veon Bell. He doesn't have to go to Sam Darnold and say, hey, hand me the ball, hand me the ball, hand me the ball. <laughs> so, or even pass plus, the ball. I mean, that to me, that's one of the one of the, the underrated things that Bell brings. Is, and he he's is a great, great, and, great and he'll be a great, yeah. th- yes, Yes, Tim, he'll be a great third down option check down for Darnold. Exactly. And I think that's something he really, especially after Powell got hurt last year, something he really didn't have. Yeah, for sure. I mean, then, and that, that to me, it, like, again, it's, I think that's what really, really helps in terms of, uh, in terms of, of Darnold's uh, development as a quarterback is he, he'll have a safe option if he needs it. I, I still think the Jets desperately need, need to upgrade wide receiver position, but you know, there, 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 there will or should be options for them. I think you can wait on that a little bit because I think they'll be better this year. I mean, Jamison Crowder is a very good slot guy. Now he was hurt last year. And again, it seems like this is like kind of a theme with McCagnan guys. It seems like he does roll the dice on guys who have had like a recent injury history. And sometimes it comes back to bite them. I mean, it might not necessarily be the same injury, but I mean, uh, Spencer Long missed uh, a good chunk of, the 2017 season with the Redskins, and then he comes to the Jets, and all of a sudden his hand is hurt, and he can't snap the ball, which is kind of a problem for a center. But, uh, <laughs> Big problem. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I Crowder missed a bunch of games last year with an ankle problem, but when he's healthy, I mean, he has, he's one of those guys, I mean, he's actually kind of like uh, almost like a Patriot slot receiver in that he's not straight line fast, but he is quick. He get separation right at the line, and that's great, guys, for a young quarterback because, boom, you see that guy flash over the middle on a slant, boom, you throw him the ball, don't have to worry about three-step drop, don't have to worry about pass rush. So I think he is going to be a major addition for the Jets. Yeah, I mean, I I, I don't see anything. To me, like I said, I, I thought they had to get him. I was actually kind of surprised when I heard four years, $52 because I thought it was going to take more than that. Um you know, I don't know who else was interested. I had a feeling that the Bears were interested because I know that uh, that they're looking for somebody to catch more passes out of the backfield. <clears throat> but you know, to me, again, this this was something the Jets needed to do, desperately needed to do. Well, I think guys. Well, the Ravens were interested too in Bell, and who knows? Maybe it was a case where the Jets were. Busy. I mean, let's face it, Bell can spin it every oh, any way he wants. But I mean, he could have been making a little slightly more money with the Steelers. I mean, uh, right. yeah, I mean the. the the, the the franchise tag last year would have netted him fourteen point five four million, and if you go average per year, he's making about a million less this year. Yeah, exactly, and I, that that's the part I don't understand. He did he didn't make up the money that he would have made last year. Not no, he all. didn't. Not at yeah, all. He didn't. But which uh, let's face it, we all know now. Uh, whatever the deal, and I believe he's. I mean, he's at that obviously that you know Saquon Barkley level. He's that elite running back. I mean, not just a thousand yard guy, but an elite guy. But, again, we all know now that – and, again, that's why, Tim, you're right, the Mosley thing was surprising because 
inside linebacker like running back, they just aren't premium positions anymore. Right, and Mosley is getting $17 million a year. I think I think I, I remember seeing that the second or, or the previous highest paid inside linebacker was like about $12 million. So the Jets blew that out of the water. Yeah. But, uh, but, was, that, but was that because Mosley maybe didn't want to leave Bold, or, uh, the, the Ravens, or was that just because – you know, were, were other teams, were they bidding against themselves or were they bidding against somebody else? I mean, that's just such a massive overpay, it seems. Well, I mean, I think uh, it, it could have been – I mean, let's face it. We know one thing. Greg Williams had a lot of influence on uh, who he wanted. So I'm sure he had a big say in it. And with the fact that they just brought him on board, they, and especially making him run a 3-4, they wanted to keep him happy. But, yes, it was – well, but maybe they figured, hey, we, we underpaid for Bell, so to speak, so we can overpay for this guy. Uh, what I think the, the biggest thing, guys, I think uh, I was kind of, well, I wasn't surprised because he doesn't value them. It's kind of like a money ball thing in baseball. Right. I mean, he let two pro bowlers on special teams walk and really didn't offer either of them much, and that was kind of surprising. Yeah, the kicker and and, uh, and Andre Roberts, the kicker. Yeah. Yeah, Jay. Now, I think, now, Myers, I think they'll be okay with losing them because they brought back uh, – uh, the guy they had two years ago, Chandler uh, Catanzaro, right? Uh, who is, who honestly is known as Catman. So you can <laughs> Catman. Nah, 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 nah. Okay, okay, JP. But, but, uh, cat, cat but, man, the, but the, but cat the kick do. returner, but the kick returner guys, it's like they're putting a lot of pressure on the special teams coach Brent Boyer. Like, okay, you got to scheme up returns because I don't think I don't think I don't want to sound like I'm Peter King or somebody, but I don't think the public sometimes understands being a good kickoff returner isn't just about straight line speed. You have to you know, you have to hit the hole right. You have to work your blocks and, and not outrun your blocks. I mean, and Roberts was great if you watch him. At, now, Grant, he got great blocking, but he was great at picking a hole and using his blockers, and that's not easy. And then they'll probably rely on his sixth round. Again, McCagnan likes his draft picks. So they're probably going to rely on their sixth rounder they got last year out of Virginia State, a kid named Trenton Cannon. Okay. He was a backup running back, so that's probably – and I guess Crowder would return punts. He did it with Washington. We're talking with J.P. Pelsman. He is the Jets beat writer for Forbes.com, and we're talking football because this week, my brother, I feel confident talking football instead of like the combine stuff. And, but, but you know what? This, one thing about this past week is that free agency in football is not like baseball, where, mm-hmm. where football, it's, it's like, okay, who can we sign this week right now? Where in baseball, <laughs> it, it's, it seems a little slower, and I'm not sure <laughs> no, why. It's slower. <laughs> JP, let me let me ask you a, a question. Two qu- Well, I've got a couple of questions. Um, talk about Anthony Barr and what happened there. Um, and and were were the Jets upset about that, or were they just kind of like, all right, well, the, the, we'll we'll just address it in the draft? No, they were upset about that, but uh, I think I think he used them. I think that's happened before. I think that's why. After that happened, uh, you remember that happened before they signed Bell. They kind of went to Bell and said, hey. This is our deadline, okay? If you're interested, uh, get back to us. We're not going to keep waiting on you. Uh, but I think Barr used them to get a better deal for Minnesota. But as I wrote on Forbes.com, I think actually he did them a favor because they were going to – this guy hadn't rushed the passer since he was at UCLA six years ago. Yeah. He, was they good. Were he was to, good at UCLA. The kid, kid had oh, a motor back then. He was very good as a pass rusher. Had a but, motor. But <clears throat> five years of playing basically a 4-3 end – and now you're going to switch him to a 3-4 upright linebacker and ask him to rush the passer, which he hardly did against Minnesota. Now, but part of the reason about that was I looked this up. I thought this was interesting. He had three sacks guys last season. Well, two of them were against uh, Ryan Tannehill. So I mean, we know he used to coach <laughs> the Dolphins. So maybe Gase was like, oh, well, this guy looks like a great pass. Yeah, yeah, he got two sacks against you and one against everybody else. But- <laughs> Ryan, Ryan Tannehill being the guy that Herm Edwards was talking about that he wants the guys to run around. <laughs> <laughs> But don't get me wrong. I mean, he wasn't asked to rush the passer, so I thought that was kind of a weird fit. I, I, I mean, again, um, I mean, we all know, talking about the NFL draft, which you guys mentioned, there's so much smoke and mirrors. Now, who knows if Kyler Murray will or will not go number one. But if he does, then there's no question the Jets will get a good pass rusher in the draft. So maybe they can address that there. Well, to me, if Kyler Murray goes number one, I, I could see Nick Bosa maybe falling to the Jets. He could fall there. No, he could fall there, yeah. So you figure, though, either Nick Bosa – or uh, the other Josh Allen falls to... Right. It'd be funny if Josh Allen sacked Josh Allen, actually. That'd be well, fun. I, uh, I think if the Jets pick Josh Allen, I think they're probably hoping that happens often. <laughs> exactly. Josh Allen, Josh Allen crime. But, uh, but 
you know, I, I think they can get the, the pass rusher they need. I mean, I just I, I think they have to stop ski, thinking, oh, we could scheme up sacks. How did that work for Todd Bowles? You know what I mean? No, I, that doesn't I, work. <laughs> you have to. I mean, let's face it. This is not hyperbole, guys. They haven't had a, an edge rusher who makes – Opposing offensive coordinators lose sleep since John Abraham, and they traded him away in in 2006 before the draft. Yeah, we're talking a That's long, how long time it's ago. Been. I, you know, I mean, the the weird thing to me is the last couple of drafts. It seems like the Jets have just had, or the last few. I mean, the Jets have had guys fall into their laps. I mean, Sam Darnold, you could say, fell into their laps because probably the Giants should have picked him. Now that you look back at it and see that the Giants are having all these issues with quarterbacks still. Uh, uh, what's his name? Jamal Adams to me was the best player in that draft. Fell into their laps. Uh, you could say the same for Leonard Williams as well. A couple of years ago, a few years ago, oh, a lot of people, a lot of people thought fortunate. he, was, yeah, a lot of people thought he was the best player in the draft. And again, fell to the Jets. Now the fact that the Jets have had all of these top three or top six picks in the last three years uh, obviously doesn't say much for uh, for what else they've been doing uh, no. out, outside of the no. draft, but. In recent years, they have have had good first round picks, and and the best guy seems to find them. So yes. whether that whether or not that happens this time, I mean, you know, we we've talked on the show about the, the the possibility of the Jets trading this pick and trying to amass some draft capital after they had to trade the three three second round picks last year for uh, Sam Darnold. But it seems to me like there's going to be an, an obvious. You know, really elite player there, so it would seem that it would be a, either a mistake to trade out of that spot, or it would be it would require a, a massive haul back to have somebody trade up. Um, the you know I I I wouldn't be averse to the Jets trading down into around maybe the ten range, and I'm trying to remember the guy who was the the, the receiver that blew up the combine. Metcalf of yeah. Mississippi, yeah, the yeah Mississippi State kid. I, it seems to me like he'd be a great guy to pick. I mean, you know, he seems he seems to do everything well. I know he was hurt in, hurt in college this year, so he wasn't really able to show what he can do uh, with catching the ball. But combine wise, he was he was unbelievable. I mean, he did he did everything at an elite level. Well, here's how I look at it, Tim: is it, kind of the same way you do. If 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 Kyler Murray goes at number one, I'm staying put because I'm going to get one of those two edge rushers, right? If he doesn't go number one, and it looks like, and obviously they'll have time to figure this out, but then I start working the phones and saying, okay, uh, I mean, Quinn Williams of Alabama, but again, he's a he's a, a an interior guy. I mean, he'd project as an end in the three four, but and he he was actually a good pass rusher for an interior lineman, but still, right. he's not an edge rusher that's going to uh, be. A, I mean, don't get me wrong, he's an incredible talent. I mean, I was going to say uh, Quinn, Quinn Williams could to, to me could be like an Aaron Donald type. He could and, be. And, he and could I, be. So, I don't want to put that on because Aaron Donald is unbelievable. No, but he could be. So I'm saying that's that would be the decision. Okay, right. do you take Quinton Williams, who is an elite player, or do you, like you said, do you trade down and see if maybe you can get that wide out, or maybe you can uh, fill some other hole? I mean, uh, yeah, and plus it, acquire it picks. That, yeah. That's when the decision becomes. That to me is when when you have a decision. But to me, it's a no brainer if Murray goes first because then you get your edge rusher. Right, for sure. I agree 100 percent with you. But in in terms of, well, let me ask you this also, just in, you know, to to kind of get away from the draft a little bit. How much more cap room do the Jets have, and and what other needs are they looking for? Because there's still players out there. I mean, obviously the frenzy of of the NFL. I, I love what they call it. What do they call it? Uh, the the legal um, legal tampering. Legal tampering, which uh, to, uh, talk about oxymorons. Uh, but that period is and over. Still, and guys, they, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, they still subvert that because I mean, I mean, some insider broke like a sign like at twelve fifteen that day. Oh yeah, they just start negotiating at noon. I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. Good point. Good point. <laughs> yeah, doesn't work that way. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, well, cornerback. I mean, they're still right now. They're kind of uh, uh, short a cornerback. I mean, uh, 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 they need a cornerback. Uh, and like you guys said, they do need a wide receiver. There's no elite ones out there. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think they have about fifty million left right now. Last time I looked, that's uh, not bad. Five zero or one five? No, fifty. F- five zero. Five zero. Uh, that's wow. pretty good. That's amazing. Well, because let's face it, because it's a couple of the moves they thought they were. I mean, right. obviously, if they had made the bar move, they'd have a lot less. But right. uh, so, like I said, I still think that was uh, one of the best uh, deals you don't make. But uh, yeah, they have. They still have needs, and and I'll say this much for all the, and McCann gets a lot of deserved heat. Believe me, his big ticket 
signs haven't gone well, but uh, uh, Trumaine Johnson, anyone, but uh, <laughs> but he sometimes, you know, when he shops in that you know bargain bargain bin, uh, you know, like when you find one of those, uh, you, know, you find a great 1970s cassette in the bargain bin, you know, sometimes you get some decent value there. <laughs> Led Zeppelin three, exactly. Uh, JP, I just want to ask you, um, outside of the Jets right now, just a couple of things. First of all, Nick Foles signs with Jacksonville, which I was a little shocked by. I thought he was maybe that Philadelphia might keep him or do some, sign him and then trade him or do something. And then the other one we haven't talked about yet, Odell Beckham Jr., gone. <laughs> well, well, first of all, to, to, to with Foles, trade. I was just surprised by the money. I mean, that's, yeah, that's uh, what I was surprised by. That's a lot of money for Nick Foles. And don't get me wrong, he's a... I'm going to sound like uh, another broadcast. I mean, don't get me wrong; he's a solid guy. Oh, he's solid. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but that kind of money. I mean, he's not a game changer to me. He's he's like a step above what Bill Parcells used to go uh, hold the fort guy. I mean, he's still not uh, the franchise guy that. You know, I mean, Jacksonville's another team that's been seeking a franchise guy ever since uh, ever since Mark Brunel got old. But I mean, you, yeah. so. but you don't think uh, Nick Foles leading the the Eagles to the Super Bowl and winning last year, no. and, and even this uh, this past year. You know, bringing him to the playoffs. I think he had a great team around him. Don't get me yeah. wrong. I'm not saying I don't respect his talent, but he's not a guy that you need to have a good team around him. I mean, I, I still don't think he's a guy that is going to lift everybody up like a Brady or a Breeze. That's yeah, what I'm but, but, getting at. But Jacksonville is operating yeah. under the assumption that they, they're still – uh, a, a player or two away. I mean, they, they were terrible last year, but two years ago they thought they were a Super Super Bowl team. And I think that last season that they just figured, all right, you know what, Blake Bortles is so bad that we have no shot with him, and if we have a, a legitimate quarterback that we're going to put ourselves back in the Super Bowl contention picture. No, I, I get, I get but, what they did, and I, yeah. I don't have a problem with it. But like I said, I just have a problem with the money. I just think that's a – Yeah, $22 that's million a, a year for Nick Foles is big. That's a big ticket for a guy. I mean, but again, it was the same thing when Kirk Cousins was signed. I mean, I saw him play against the Jets last year with the Vikings, and again, he's a good quarterback. Nothing wrong with it. His numbers are good. But again, I put him in the Kirk Cousins level that you need the team around him right. because he is not going to single-handedly – Lift up guys like like Peyton back in the day, or Brady, Breeze, Aaron Rodgers, etc. Right. As, as it turned as it turned out, the, the Jets were pretty lucky. The Cousins said no. <laughs> no, again, again, that's again like to me that'll be like Barr. It'd be like you know again a guy spurned there from Minnesota, so maybe it'll work out like that. That uh, guy who uh, chose Minnesota over the Jets uh, turned out to be a good move for them. As far as OBJ, I mean, I just don't uh, again. I know I'm the eight. 8,876 person to say this, but I don't know what Dave Gettleman is doing. I don't know what the plan is there. There is unless, no plan. Unless the plan is to draft Haskins at number six and uh, do the Kansas City thing and have him sit behind Eli for a year or at least a portion of a year and learn. Uh, but then Eli's got such a big cap number this year. I mean, to me, you should have. They should have figured out long ago if they felt Beckham was too tough to control and too much of a bad apple and, and, and too much of a problem in the locker room. Then you have to, you you have to trade him at a higher value and get more for him. You can't. I, I just don't know what they were thinking. And, and let's face it. I mean, Peppers is a wonderful talent, but really he's been kind of underwhelming in Cleveland. Yeah, and and he's he's also kind of a man without a position. I mean, some. That's to, a great point. To me, to me, the people who were a little more gung-ho about this trade, because there are people who, who have just completely panned this trade from a Giants perspective, and, and I'm one of them. But you you look at people were saying, well, getting Peppers is like getting a number one pick. Well, no, he's not, because he's, he doesn't really have a position. He's a phenomenal athlete, but he's not necessarily a phenomenal football player. He does he, he does a lot of area. He I mean he right now he's your kick returner, no doubt. I mean he's that kind of talent that fine, put put him back there. But defensively, they moved him to safety last year and, and he, he he became that became kind of a better position for him. But he he's kind of a tweener. Like is he a safety or a linebacker? And you know, how just I don't know what, what he's going to do or how he's gonna do it, but it seems like here's a guy who has immense athletic gifts but doesn't necessarily have a position on the football field. Well, no, you're exactly right, Tim. I mean, that's uh, – it reminds me of the recruiting services now for, for college guys, uh, guys coming out of high school, and they will list guys. They won't even list a position. They'll just say athlete. Right. And and he was one of those type of guys. And the problem is that translates better into college when 
Well, let's face it, every team you're going against doesn't have an elite athlete at every position, and you can move them around like a, a piece on a chessboard and get the most out of them. But in the pros, like you said, that really doesn't fly. You need to have a hard and fast position, or you're really not going to contribute as much as you can. And I also would add to what you said, you make another good point, is to me, and, and this is a big problem with the Jets in the, in the past, not to just put it on them, but they, they would fall in love with a guy and say, uh, in the draft, right? Let's say, let's say they didn't get him, and two years later or whatever, he's available in a trade or whatever. Oh, we had a first round draft, a first round regular guy. Well, guess what? He's had two years, two or three years in the NFL, and he doesn't look like a first rounder. And you made that point, right? Yes, Peppers was a first round talent. He doesn't look like a first rounder right now. No, not at all. So and, 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 it's a, again, it's a, it's a roll of the dice, and and I just think Gettleman again. I don't want to. I mean, I know he had health issues and everything, but. You just wonder if he's he's operating under like the NFL of ten years ago and not realizing how much the game has changed. I know it's an obvious thing to say, but you feel like maybe the game's passed him by. It's, it's possible. I mean, it, it, that trade was was just a mess. So I don't know. JP, we have to get going. Thanks for joining us, JP Pelsman, the Jets beat writer Thanks for Forbes. Uh, dot com. Is it Forbes dot com? And then do a search on Jets. Is that how we read your articles? Yes, that would be a good idea. Yes. Okay, do that. Go to Forbes dot com. Go to the search engine and hit type in New York Jets or J.P. Pelsman. Pelsman. Or Pelsman, J.P. Pelsman. That's not yeah. a bad thing. J.P., thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you probably around uh, sp- uh, training camp. Draft. Draft couple, time. Draft time. Maybe draft time. That's in a couple of months. That sounds good. Take okay, care, guys. Talk, to, talk to you later, man. Bye-bye. Take care, J.P. Good stuff. Bye. We're, uh, we're 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College. You're listening to From the Press Box. I'm Rob Leonard. He is Tim Leonard. Tim, you're at uh, Twitter at? At Real Tim Leonard. Frank Sinatra. Bing Crosby. Ella Fitzgerald. Dean Martin. Hey, guys, what are you doing? We're making a list of artists you don't hear on the radio anymore. Wait, I know where you can hear all of them and more. Where? Right here on Standard Serenade. Join me, Glenn DeMilt, for two hours of great songs by the great stars. Saturday afternoon at 5 on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 90.3 WHPC. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. The Spectacular 60s with host Joe Lane. <laughs> the music that defined a generation. Sundays at 7 p.m. on The Voice of Nassau Community College. 90.3 WHPC. 90.3 WHPC. From the press box on your radio or on your listening device, iHeartRadio app, tunein.com, nccradio.org. Remembering the great Dick Dale, who passed away yesterday. I feel like I'm uh, watching... Uh, What's the movie? I can't remember the movie now. You don't remember the movie? Quentin Tarantino? I can't remember. I can't remember. Travolta, Grand Royale. Oh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction, I can't remember. What's he talking about? I don't know. Anyway, Miserloo right there. And you're listening to From the Press Box. By the way, brother, full Irish every Saturday at 11 a.m. This program provides Irish music and news of interest to the Irish-American community. Hosted by Gary Power. That's Full Irish every Saturday at 11 a.m. And by the way, everyone, happy St. Joseph Day. St. Patrick's Day. Today is St. Joseph Day. No, we're done with that. It gets the day you get to eat cannolis. You should know that, brother. You love cannolis. I do love cannolis. So then you should know that. that. I was dealing with a lot of wannabe Irish on on the train on Saturday. Of course. Of course. It was all all poses. Terrible. They think they wear green and they get away with things. Anyway, brother, um, I, had, I had to tell I had to tell one girl just just looked right right in the face and said, "Get away from me, drunk girl." That's right. Anyway, this was on uh, the train. Oh well, oh, yeah, unbelievable. Um, the Yankees, brother, the uh, are they ready to go for the Yankees? Are already ready? Are they to go? They're hitting bombs left and right. They, they, they are, and and here here, brother, is something that I wasn't sure I would ever see again. Jacoby Ellsbury has reported to spring training. I, 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 I honestly thought he was in a witness protection program. He has right. not been seen or heard from. Uh, apparently, he is going to address the media today. In fact, he might be doing it right now. Um, but 
Jacoby Ellsbury is back. Where was he hiding? Uh, he, he was. He's been hurt. He's been. He's been injured. He's. He's had a lot of a lot of uh, procedures. Um, he had uh, plantar fasciitis this spring, which is why he's been away for the first month of spring training. Um, but apparently, he is. Uh, he is now healthy again. And who knows? He could contribute. Uh, Aaron Hicks. Uh, the center fielder who the Yankees signed uh, recently to a seven-year, $70 million extension uh, will start the season on, on the injured list. And there, there, is, there is a window for Jacoby Ellsbury to, to come in and contribute. Uh, it's quite likely that Brett Gardner will start the season in center field with Hicks on, on the IL, um, which probably pushes Clint Frazier into left field. Right. But that makes Jacoby Ellsbury the fourth outfielder as far as I'm concerned because I don't think Stanton, Giancarlo Stanton, I don't think he's even going to factor into the outfield. I think he's going to be the full-time DH. Uh, but obviously they could use him in the outfield if need be. But now there's apparently a, 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 a slight role for Jacoby Ellsbury who, whose contract can't run out fast enough. Um, what, this, this, is, this, is, this is one of the worst signings in, in, in Brian Cashman's uh, story to history as as the general manager of the New York Yankees. He's had some good signings. Um, it, it's it, it's just been a disaster. This is Carl Pavano level kind of ineptitude. <laughs> um, but you know, as as Jacoby Ellsbury's contract runs out, it's more than possible that they could trade him and get something in return that could help. Whether they're trading bad contracts, there was a rumor going around early early in spring that that they could trade uh, Ellsbury. To the Giants for Johnny Cueto, who's got another bad contract and is also injured. Uh, I would make that trade if I was the Yankees, but uh, you know we'll we'll see what happens. But uh, again, you know, hey, Ellsbury, he's back. Uh, right. Like I said, as far as the Yankees go, and, and with with the way things are, it's entirely possible uh, that we could have Greg Bird and Luke Voigt making the team. Uh, both those guys have been tearing up spring training. Uh, both of those guys deserve a spot on the roster, but Aaron Boone has said. He doesn't necessarily want to carry both of them because he's looking at DJ LeMahieu as the backup first baseman. Uh, Bird, ne- neither Bird nor Voigt really could play the outfield. I mean, they're both pretty much limited to first base or you know first base DH. But if if Stanton is going to be your full time DH as, as I expect, then obviously it, it's it, there are limited opportunities there. So. Sounds like the Yankees might have too many players. Uh, well, of talent. to be good, to be good players, well, and, and that's, that's a good problem to have. Uh, I well, still... not really, because sometimes these players need to play every day, and if they're not, well, you know, platooning worked on the '86 Mets, but you know, those guys weren't the, you know, wasn't they were they weren't platooning Keith or Hernandez, you know. I I still am of the mindset that the Yankees this season, assuming good health or reasonably good health, this is a team that's going to threaten 300 home runs in a season, which is a, a, just an unbelievable number, and it would break their own record by a, a, a couple dozen. But that's that's how much power they have. It's unbelievable. Everybody on this team hits home runs, and, and everybody hits a lot of home runs. Gary Sanchez still hasn't hit this spring, but if he gets if he gets his 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 stroke back, figure thirty or thirty five home runs, and, and obviously Stanton and Judge have fifty home run potential. Uh, Bird and Voigt both you know, both should hit at least twenty, assuming they both get get enough at bats. Uh, Tulowitzki hit a home run yesterday and, and is starting to find his swing. I know some people have been down on him because he started slow, but the guy hasn't played in a year and a half. He needs at bats. So, you know, things right now, it's, again, it's, it comes back to pitching. Um, they, the Yankees announced that Luis Severino probably won't pitch until May, so he's going to miss the first month of the season. And CC has some health CC's issues. CC's got some health issues, so there, there's been some rumors lately about the, the possibility of signing Gio Gonzalez, okay. uh, which – they could they could probably get him on a one year deal for five five or six million and then figure it out later when everybody gets healthy if everybody stays healthy. Right. I mean, it's, it's it's not a bad idea to have a sixth pitcher on a major league roster these days. We should also say the Islanders are back tied in first place in the Metropolitan Division with the Washington Capitals and uh, the they, playoffs. They beat, they beat the the Minnesota, Minnesota Wild, Wild last night three two. Brock well, Nelson had an overtime goal. And uh, Minnesota native Brock Nelson. Yeah, so we, you know, looks like the Islanders. Uh, it's getting closer to the playoffs. So we look forward to the Islanders being there. The first round will be at the Coliseum. Second round, if the Islanders make it, will be at the Barclays. I still want to party with Clark Gillies. By the way, Clark Gillies. We got anybody find, knows Clark Gillies? Have him call in the show. We got to find out where he's partying. I'm sure the, the Islanders. You know, I give Ledecky. Some, and the other guy, Malkin. Yes. Malkin. What they did was, when they were going to Barclays, they 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 paid. Obviously, they'd have like 
Gillies and Nystrom, right. and I think Mike Bossy was even on the, the train going right. to Barclays. So, I mean, imagine you're on the train and you, you, you're having a couple of dips, and then you, all of a sudden you see Gillies there. It's Clark Gillies. Hey, Nystrom. Yeah, Bob, yeah, have a beer with no, us. I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking to party with Clark Gillies. We'll do a live broadcast. I would love if, to. If, if Clark Gillies will party with us in the Coliseum parking lot. We How will, about that? There's have, an offer. We will have to. I will call some friends. We'll work on that. Anyway, you've been listening to From the Press Box right here on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College. I'm Rob Leonard. He is Tim Leonard. Tim, you're at Twitter at? At Real Tim Leonard. Coming up next is Big Ed Newlands with The Good Gold Show. So keep it tuned here, and we appreciate it. We'll see you in 167 hours. I'll see you with Friday with Beatles songs at 8 p.m. I'll see you on Sunday with the Free For All. Bye-bye. 90.3 WHPC wants to let you know that Wednesday, April 17th, is our second ever WHPC day at Miller's Ale House of Levittown. On Wednesday, April 17th, Miller's Ale House of Levittown is hosting a Give Back Day to support WHPC. More information can be found by searching for 90.3 WHPC on Facebook at 903 WHPC on Twitter or at 903 WHPC on Instagram. Miller's Ale House is located at 30. 3046 Hempstead Turnpike in Levittown, across from the Tri-County Flea Market, where WHPC's Give Back Day is Wednesday, April 17th, from 11.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. Thanks to you and Miller's Ale House of Levittown for supporting the non-commercial educational radio at the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC.